Good morning everyone. I am Professor Ikin Salvador Amores, Director of the Museo Cordillera and Professor of Anthropology at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Today, I am going to talk about the process of curatorial practice, conceptualizing museum exhibitions. The challenge for many museums I've seen is how to take that deep curatorial knowledge and enthusiasm in developing ways on how to translate it into an exhibition format that does not require the visitor to take a guided tour to gain a full understanding of the exhibition. To start with, there are many books on curation. And here are some of the outstanding and useful materials that you could use for curatorial work. And some provide a step-by-step -step guide on how to curate. If you see the literature on curation, it now moves from theoretical to applied and at the moment into digital curation caused by the pandemic. As we all know, museums have to move to digital curation for an online platform. Another resource that you could look at is the ICOM website, which could provide the current situation and trends on curatorial work. In this presentation, I would like to talk about the following. Who is a curator? What do they do and how they do it? Why is curation important for the museum? What is the process of curatorial practice? How do we conceptualize a museum exhibition? And lastly, I will take on a case study of the Feast of Merit exhibition of the Museo Cordillera to elucidate some important points. I often cringe when I am called a curator. Being a curator takes a lot of learning beyond the books and solid experience in the application of the principles in the actual museum setting. My experience as a curator started first as an anthropologist, as a researcher of the Cordillera culture. It is in this context that I come from with disciplinary authority and be able to tell the stories of the people visually and content-based from the field notes that we gather in collaboration with the different communities. What is a curator? Who is a curator? A curator is a person in charge of, of a museum or other places where objects of art, science, or from the past are collected, or a person who is in charge of selecting and caring for objects to be shown in a museum or to form part of a collection. Traditionally, a curator or a keeper of a cultural heritage institution is a content specialist charged with an institution's collections and involved with the interpretation of heritage material, including historical facts. But the fun part of being curator is that curators often lead a life of adventure, traveling the world to do fieldwork and research. They build permanent collections that function as an empirical library of life and culture for the benefit of a human society. The challenging part is when the curator is confronted with a lot of information of objects. How do you bring this story into fold for your target audience and to properly represent the culture under study so as to avoid misrepresentation, most especially in an ethnographic museum such as the Museo Cordillera? At the back of the mind of a curator, we also ask the following questions. Can artifacts speak? How can objects tell narratives? If the artifacts are stored for a long time, how can we activate them to speak and create stories? How can the biography of objects translate narratives to an exhibition? Acquiring objects and displaying them in the exhibition should not be the end of the story. Objects can actually speak once their inert information are activated through careful research. If the aim of our museum is to educate, then our objects and our museum collection should be our learning toolkit. And more so, we should think of creative ways on how to best elicit stories from the past to the present. In the museum setting, the objects do not just provide the stage, but they are integral to the narrative of the exhibition objects and its relations to people inform each other. 
One crucial thought in the process of curatorial practice is conceptualizing a museum exhibition, the one statement message, and identifying what kind of objects are to, ex are to be exhibited, otherwise known as artifacts, and how these relate to people and things. If we recall the previous webinars, researching the biography of objects and writing a story of the objects for an exhibition adds to the significance of the objects, again, according to the context of the situation. How then can museum practitioners make use of these objects in their exhibition to elicit stories? How can this impact the lives of the people through these objects? The Journal of Museum Education published a short and sensible piece by anthropologist Nelson Graburn called The Museum and the Visitor Experience. Graburn argues that museums, like other cultural institutions, must understand and satisfy three kinds of experiential needs, the associational, the educational, and reverential. Associational, which is an excuse, excuse or focus for a social occasion. The educational refers to where one learns something about the world, and reverential, which designates the visitor's need for a personal experience mm -hmm. with something higher, more sacred, and out of the ordinary than home and work are able to supply. This framework offers a useful way of thinking about recent and alternative perspectives on exhibitions. In addition, museums should also pay attention to what she calls as magic of the museum, which he would refer to as those moments of enchantment that transpire when people interact with things. In the same way, when anthropologist Alfred Gell described how an object was created to astound its users through the technology of enchantment. In his book, Art and Agency, Alfred Gell talked about this technology of enchantment. This is a, a wooden probe decorated with shells found in Melanesia. And as it travels around the seas, it acquires this enchantment. It acquires prestige among its members. In the Philippines and in our own communities, there are objects that enchant us. We just need to look for them and conduct a thorough documentation and research. Now returning to the magic or the moments inside the museum, I would like to focus on the reverential aspect where this becomes experiential. Here I speak of the resonance that one experiences inside the museum. This refers to the power of displayed object to reach out beyond its formal boundaries to a larger world, to evoke in the viewer the complex dynamic cultural forces from which it has emerged and for which it may be taken by the viewer to stand. On the other hand, wonder is the power of the displayed object to stop the viewer in his or her tracks to convey an arresting sense of uniqueness, to evoke an exalted attention. These reactions then should be the museum exhibition's benchmarks for the medium's potential to transform how visitors understand a particular set of ideas of themselves and the world. Enchantment is present when resonance and wonder are present and elicited through our objects. The challenge now is, how can we achieve this resonance and wonder from our museum visitors? For instance, the Golden Tara from Agusan Manobo is found at the Field Museum of Chicago. This is one of the artifacts that were found uh, in the Philippines. And this is displayed in, uh, in a room full of gold ornaments from different societies, different cultures. But once you see this, you get this feel of enchantment and wonder at the same time. Objects, when defined 
refers to artifacts and things, but they are in fact objects that are commonly referred to as material culture. These are the tangible things that people produce with functional purpose and aesthetics and meanings. They are the material things that people encounter and objects that people interact with and use. Objects are created to make visible the stable cultural categories to deploy discriminating values and to mark aspects of themselves and others. Studies on material culture have, ha have their primary concern regarding the mutual relations between people and objects. In particular, studies of material culture are concerned what uses people put objects to and what objects do for and to people. Furthermore, scholars working in the field of material culture studies aim to analyze how these relations are one of the important ways in which culture and the meanings upon which culture is based are transmitted, received, and produced. In general, material culture refers to any object such as jewelry, textiles, pottery, wood carving, and others, or a network of material objects, rice granary, a shrine, an ator in Bontok, that people perceive, touch, and use, and handle to carry out social activities with and to contemplate upon. These projects, these objects are produced with varying motivations, transformations, and use. Thus, it is relevant to look at why and how these objects animate relations with people. For instance, this is an artifact from the Leipzig Museum in Germany. This was collected 150 years ago by uh, an early German traveler named Hans Mayer. So this object can, are no longer seen in the Cordillera, but this is, is in fact um, a, uh, a tweezer, no? and uh, that, uh, a tweezer, and it is used to remove the hair under your nose or under your um, sh um, face or something. So this one is no longer produced in the Cordillera, and these are found in Leipzig Museum. So you can see how ornate this this thing is, uh, with the chains and the brass material that was used in this particular ornament and functional object among the Cordillera people. These are other objects that are also found in Dresden Museum in Germany. Uh, these are 150, 150 years old, collected by Alexander Schadenberg and Adolf Mayer, Hans Mayer, and are deposited in this museum. So when I saw this for the first time, you could see that they are uh, exquisite in itself. And this shows how uh, material culture uh, are produced in the, in the Cordillera with with very high uh, craftsmanship. While studies in material culture have started uh, as a subfield in archaeology and anthropology, material culture is a newly developed field in the University College London with Professor Daniel Miller as a proponent for this new field of study. Although material studies have been a domain in the archaeological studies to study objects of the past, a recent approach is to look at material culture from an interdisciplinary lens, such as anthropology, cultural studies, ethno-mathematics, and even oral literature, literature studies. In the Philippines and the Cordillera region specifically, materialism or materialities have never been recognized as important social parameters in the past, although there have been early published and unpublished documentations of material culture. Today, an emerging interest is how these objects are recontextualized in the contemporary period. These recontextualizations refer to how objects move in circulation in the modern context. Here, the dynamics of recontextualization, valuation, and reinterpretation of the objects 
go along their trajectories through different cultural and historical contexts. Professor Delphine Tolentino, writing on mater material culture, says that, I quote, scholars and even museum practitioners in this case should go beyond symbolism, fetishism, or pedantry, but to examine social practices and their relations to ideologies and materialities in different contexts. It is best to document objects of material culture, and the goal is not to allow artifacts speak, but also to engage the living practitioners of the tradition to speak about the narratives of the objects. This is an enabling environment to study the objects. While the practitioners, elders, and artisans are still alive, we can all conduct interviews, invite them for informal talks, to share their knowledge and stories about relevant artifacts, and document and record these stories and make the artifacts speak. Chris Gostin writes that the central idea is that as people and objects gather time, movement, and change, they are constantly transformed, and these transformations of persons and objects are tied up with each other. Another anthropologist, Janet Hoskins, working on Indonesia, used this approach of cultural biography in eliciting memories, stories, biographies, associated and objects that people own. This approach is similar to Tringham's concept of life history. Like the biographical approach, it seeks to understand the way objects become invested with meaning through the social interactions they are caught up in. These meanings change and are renegotiated through the life of an object. Meaning emerges from social action and the purpose of an artifact and the biography is to illuminate that process. The notion of biography of object goes back to Kopitov, who felt that things could not be fully understood at just one point in their existence and processes and cycles of production, exchange, and consumption had to be looked at as a whole. Not only do objects change through their existence, but they often have the capability of accumulating histories so that the present significance of an object derives from the persons and events to which it is connected. So in the museum setting, it is best to approach objects by thinking biographically and at the same time to take on an in-depth research to bring about the materiality of the objects, how it is produced, the meanings, and the use of these objects to people's lives. It is also best to corroborate this with additional data, such as an extensive research on the literature, conducting field interviews with the remaining artisans of the objects, and most of all, interpreting all these materials to a readable format that will engage the viewers to discover and explore and hopefully achieve that resonance and wonder when they see these objects in your respective museums. The challenge of the higher educational institutions and other startup museums is how to materialize all these concepts. In the curatorial process, there are guiding principles in the process of conceptualizing an exhibition. And in between these processes, there are important questions that you would like to consider. So in conceptualizing exhibition, you start with the content development, the exhibition development, the presentation and design development, the exhibition, and the publication and ed educational programming. In between all of this, there are considerations that you have to note. In the content development, ask, what is the concept of the exhibition? What is the content of the exhibition? In the exhibit development, how will the stories develop into an exhibition? In the presentation and design development, how will the objects be displayed and how are stories told? In the exhibition, how is the exhibition received by the audience? In the publication and educational programming, what are the other programs to complement the exhibition? 
In the content development, what is crucial is the research and scholarship. Without this, one cannot set up an exhibition. The research is the basis of the narrative of the exhibition. What kind of story do you want to tell? It is important that a genealogy of the research should be unearthed. What do people say about the subject matter at hand? In the exhibition, it is important to incorporate and highlight recent research on the subject. It is also important that when developing the concept for the exhibition, the curatorial team should be able to showcase the extensive collection of the museum, ranging from artifacts, photographs, archival materials, historical for information, and contemporary research. This is to assess and look for ways on how the stored objects can be brought out to configure in the exhibition based on the specific narrative. It is also important to identify the interconnections of the objects to people and things. When possible, strive to make personal connections with visitors. Allow them to see themselves in your exhibitions. How can these objects relate to their own lives? How did this object shape their view of the world? What are the narratives told in the exhibition? One of the most challenging tasks is to determine what is the message of the exhibition. Formulating a main message is the first task of the curatorial team. For every exhibition, it should have a main message, a one-sentence statement that connects the visitor to the content and explains the relevance of the topic to them. The main message serves to guide the exhibit development and focus the choices of artifacts, stories, and experiences. Developing a main message should be the one of the first task of the curatorial team. It is otherwise known as the curatorial focus. The big idea or what is the take home messages. For instance, Barbara Cyril For instance, Barbara Cyril succinctly described this big idea in the in the exhibition. A big idea is a sentence, a statement of what exhibition is about. It is a statement of one sentence with the subject, an action, and a consequence. It should not be vague or compound. It is one big idea, not four. It also implies what the exhibit is not about. A big idea is big because it has fundamental meaningfulness that is important to human nature. It is not trivial. It is the first thing that the team together should write for an exhibition. In formulating the message, one can also break down the concept into three sub-themes leading to the main message. This will become the three sections that will form part of the main content or the threads of the exhibition. Usually they are introduced as questions that would emerge from the kind of research materials that were gathered in the conception stage. These questions will be woven into the entire exhibition. Defining an audience. Each exhibition shall have a defined audience, while the museum's overall goal has the widest possible visitorship, virtually spanning every age and nationality. An exhibition cannot be everything to all people. People have a range of expectations and learning styles. Some exhibitions will appeal to people with particular expectations or learning styles and not others. Ideally, a major exhibition should strive to satisfy a wide range of people. One way to approach defining the audience, the audience is to determine who the audience is not. An exhibit space for young children will have different requirements than a typical exhibition. An exhibition focusing on hands-on interactives may appeal mainly to children and teenagers. 
although people of other groups should be able to enjoy and learn from the from the exhibits a technical subject may appeal mainly to adults with that particular interest rather than a more general audience but it should be accessible to those without subject matter knowledge and invite them to learn and discover learning goals are takeaway messages or changes in understanding attitude or behavior that we want visitors to leave with that and that can be measured through evaluation as a measure of success it is also important to identify what are the learning goals of the exhibition that can impact the understanding, be, understanding, behavior, and attitude of the visitors. This can be measured only through surveys and evaluations conducted at the end of the museum tour of the visitors. In the exhibition development, it is best to experiment with creative ways of organizing content that move beyond traditional chronological or subject categorization or object classifications. An approach in exhibition development with visual components, images, graphics, films, spatial orientation like gallery layout, interactive placement, and verbal presentation elements such as label text, audios in combination and with visitor expectations as a primary consideration. What are the relationship of these artifacts to a larger narrative of the exhibition? Make exhibit evaluation and experimentation integral to exhibit development. In conceptualizing an exhibition, consider the space av available for the exhibition. So when designing or thinking about your exhibition, know first what is the available space in your museum and then what are the available artifacts that you could use for the narrative of your story so this is an example of a floor plan for an exhibition and also a consideration of the spaces available in the presentation and design development provide experiences within each major exhibition to engage a wide range of ages interest and knowledge levels and learning styles and abilities strive for a wow factor for every exhibition a spectacular memorable unique and innovative exhibition experience use electronic or interactive technologies to complement and reinforce exhibition themes and content use technology to convey messages not for technology's sake and you should be transparent Provide sections in each major exhibitions that can be readily upgraded to enhance the timeliness or to refresh the exhibition. Design exhibitions with spaces that are complementary and easily adapted to a variety of complementary public programming uses. Use mobile, web, and educational programming to complement and broaden the impact of the exhibition. Then you have the exhibition proper, which I will discuss in the case of the Mosaia Cordillera and the publication and educational programming of the museum. So this is the case of the second exhibition of the Mosaia Cordillera, the Feast of Merit exhibition. Uh, before we started this project, we had a curatorial team uh, for this exhibit. We had the curator, we have a program development associate, we had a museum researcher, a graphic and layout designer, and of course the director of the museum who is on top of this uh, curation and direction. So these are the available space of the Museo Cordillera. We have a reception, we have a uh, on the second floor, on the ground floor, the main exhibition hall. We have an, an exhibition hallway and we have the uh, visible storage where we keep artifacts not on display. So if we recall uh, the curatorial practice in conceptualizing exhibition, which I discussed earlier, it has five components. The content development, the exhibit development, the presentation and design development, exhibition, 
publication and educational programming. So this is the invitation and the poster that we circulated on the social media and uh, print invitations to our guests and supporters of the museum. No? So we sent this out uh, for, for the opening of the exhibition, which was on February 8, 2018. So when we started this exhibition, of course, we have to find out what has been written on the subject. So uh, the prime um, research there is the research by our professor emeritus anthropologist June Prill Brett. And there's a volume published by the Cordillera Study Center towards understanding the peoples of the Cordillera. And of course, uh, our manuscript on becoming a Mumbaki, uh, which is a, a research in Ifugao. And we also connected this concept of feasting, what is uh, feasting in Southeast Asia. And it turned out that this practice of feasting no, in uh, traditional societies are also performed in Southeast Asia. And so we have to look in uh, to the Cordillera if feasting is indeed practiced as a ritual and as a cultural practice among uh, traditional societies in the Cordillera. So in the content development, uh, we conducted research. We looked for archival materials that would show evidence of this feasting or um, rituals for the affluent societies in the Cordillera. And it turned out that this practice is very well documented in photographs and historical documents. So here we had uh, an umbrella topic on uh, umbrella theme on the Feast of Merit and uh, it's called Feast of Merit, Wealth, Status and Feasting in the Luzon Cordillera and we also created sub stories for this so we had the Hongan di Kinadangyan, Validating Status through Ifugao Feasting the Chonno or the Graded Feast of Merit among the Bontok and lastly the Ibaloy Pashit or the Economic Reading of the Cultural Icon. So this uh, main theme which is the Feast of Merit are divided into um, regional practices on feasting, the Ifugao, the Bontok and the Ibaloy. And the theme should not be more than three sub-themes. No? So these sections will form part of the bigger exhibition on the Feast of Mary. So uh, what is the centerpiece or uh, the main uh, object that will be displayed no, in, in these sections? So the curatorial team decided to have the Ifugal Ballet built inside the Musée Cordillera. So fortunately, we have a very high ceiling, so we were able to transport, carry, and rebuild an, an Ifugao Fale inside the museum, which highlights the real uh, status, no? the real house of the Kadangyan and how they lived in the past. No? So these are actually combination of objects, artifacts that are found in Ifugao culture. So this is the photograph uh, from the field. And as, as you can see, the, the, the Ifugao hut is unfinished on the other side. And the purpose of this is to show the, what are the artifacts found inside the museum. So there. So what, it's, what, it's found, uh, what are the objects that are incorporated in the fale, the objects that are found outside and inside the hut, the Ifugao hut. So you have here an Ifugao uh, woman and a man uh, dressed in the regalia for the Uya Uya ritual you know, that is also performed among the Kadangyan in Ifugao. 
And of course, the iconic figure for the Kadangyan to, to validate the Kadangyan status is the Ifugao Hagabi. So fortunately, again, uh, this was on loan. Uh, we borrowed this from our national artist, Ben Cabrera, uh, to the Museo Cordillera to be part of this exhibition. So this are uh, the the view from the from the museum shop. So you can see objects of Bulol as well as the use of archival photographs in the exhibition. The second part is the Chonno, the graded feast of merit among the Bontok. So here you can see objects that are used in the Chonno. Uh, the main um, uh, piece here is the rice granary. Uh, with the pestle that are used by women no, uh, in the performance of Chonno. Uh, traditionally, uh, the, the Lebkan uh, are, are found in the, the homes, no, in the Poblacion area on, or in other traditional communities in Bontok. But this is a sacred object and we are not allowed to bring it out no, for the exhibition. But uh, with, the, with the elders no, who understood the purpose, the goal of the Museo Cordillera, which means to educate the, the, the next generation of the Bontoc or the next generation of Filipinos who wanted to learn about the Cordillera culture, we asked the permission of the elders if we could uh, recreate or reproduce this uh, particular object. And we base this also uh, with the use of archival photographs from the Newberry Library that was documented by Dean Worcester in the early 1900s. So uh, we show these photographs to the elders no, that it was um, very well documented in the past and wondered if they can recreate this for the exhibition at Museo Cordillera. So this is a photograph of uh, Professor Juniper Brett in 1972. And this is the, the in the Bontok Ili, you can still find remnants of the, the Lebkan. And as well as, uh, we also have uh, the heirloom jars uh, owned by families no? in producing rice wine every time they perform, they perform uh, certain rituals. So again, this is on loan uh, from Professor Delfin Tolentino's family, which kindly lent us all of these heirloom jars. No? So uh, in, in the curatorial process, it's important to have an inventory of all the materials that you need for the exhibition. And where to get them. Uh, these are photos of uh, Dr. Lawrence Reed, who is a linguist and worked among the Bontok in Ginaang area in the 1960s. Now, these photographs have not been published in any uh, a print or uh, in any publication. So it is our it is his first time to have this uh, photograph shown and exhibited in the Museo Cordillera. The third one is the Ibaloi Peshit. No? So this is, uh, the Peshit is a kind of uh, feasting uh, performed by the Ibaloi in Benguet. And we have this um, clothing with uh, fine embroidery that features or reflects the status of the person who wears it, no? the Baknam or the affluent class. So these are the objects on display uh, for the uh, for the Ibaloy Peshit. No? So you have gold ornaments, baskets, adornments, and others. So in the exhibition proper, we are fortunate to have uh, the group, the uh, descendants of the Kadangyan in Kiangan Ifugao, who perform with us no? uh, the, the Uyaoy ritual, or the Himagabi, and the Himagabi are ritualizing the Hagabi to validate the status of that particular family. So they also served as, or they volunteered as living mannequins uh, during the exhibition. No? And people are really uh, very appreciative and uh, surprised to see this. No? And uh, we have living mannequins in the museum during the opening. So, and a lot of people uh, are, are very curious about uh, these objects, of the people that were there and uh, participating in this uh, very um, enlightening exhibition about Ifugao, Bontok, and Ibaloy culture. 
So in terms of publication, uh, the Museo Cordillera also produced a publication on the exhibition. It's a book catalog of, uh, of the Feast of Merit. So we had uh, four chapters written about feasting in the Cordillera and also a catalog of the objects exhibited uh, in the exhibition. And uh, for the purposes of education, we also published flyers for the teachers who are who had um, a lot of questions about the Feast of Merit, they can actually take this one-page flyer about the Feast of Merit. We also produce postcards about the ex exhibition, which could also be used for uh, teaching no? uh, on, the, on the Cordillera culture, specifically on the aspects of uh, Feast of Merit. Uh, in the publication, you can see here the, the objects, the artifacts that were displayed, such as the bulls, of the uh, coming from Ifugao, as well as the textiles used in fisting, uh, all the detailed information uh, are all there. So, in relation to other uh, the, the publications and other collateral activities, we also came up with uh, lectures related to the exhibition as part of the educational programming of the Museo Cordillera. So, we had lectures on uh, lecture series on applied museology so we invited experts to give a lecture on how to conserve artifacts and other related uh, subjects in relation to museology and we also had a series on how to read artifacts uh, such as the bulol, uh, musical instruments, cordillera textiles and uh, cordillera baskets so these are all connected to the exhibition and uh, we invited specialists or experts who are knowledgeable in the area and this is open to the public as part of the educational programming of the museum so the question now leads us to how successful is your exhibition uh, well uh, as we discussed yesterday with professor Tolentino uh, a successful exhibition is uh, when you have uh, evaluations, no? And uh, what part of the indicator for a successful exhibition is when students group tours come to the museum, uh, people are, are at all uh, with the exhibition, such as this, no? So we have miniature hats with uh, items inside, and people, the students, are at all with this. And uh, we see um, descendants on, you know, from the Iboloi communities who had come to see traditional garb, traditional attire of their ancestors. You know? So in that way, it reconnects them from the past and how they can actually uh, perform you know, or do well in the present. So, you, uh, so uh, with the Feast of Merit exhibition, um, People are taking photographs, people are asking questions, people are touching the objects, and they also enter into our Ifugo house, where you can touch, feel, read information about it, and they are very enthusiastic in learning uh, about the objects in the exhibition. So these are teachers with their students coming in uh, to understand the Ifugo culture. So I think that is my lecture and um, let's discuss further on how to curate your own exhibition in your own institutions. Thank you, Hagio, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Annalina Morris for that lecture. Uh, so he can talk about the cur curator's role in the exhibition, the process of the curatorial practice, how to conceptualize the museum exhibition, and she illustrated all this uh, through the experience of Museo Cordillera's uh, exhibit on Feasts of Mary. Okay, so I think we're, we're ready for the uh, Q&A with uh, Dr. Amores on her talk. So I think we will begin with uh, this question. It is from an anonymous attendee. Hello, anonymous attendee, wherever you are. Okay, and the question is, uh, what skills or educational professional background do aspiring curators need as there are no 
new theology programs in the Philippines, where does one start her or his journey in wanting to be a good curator? This is especially for HEIs who want to establish their own museums, but they have no professionally trained staff in museology. Okay, thank you, Ruth, for that. Uh, well, very interesting um, question about curators. No, um, well, I think the the main ingredient to become a curator is the passion and your enthusiasm uh, about uh, culture and history of, of your place. No, so I think that's the the, the main uh, ingredient. And then uh, second is to be able to attend to different trainings, uh, such as these webinars. Uh, trainings offered by different museums. Now the National Museum is offering a, uh, a short-term course on that. No, uh, but usually uh, a curator should have at least a background on uh, anthropology, history, and other allied uh, disciplines. Or if you are curating art museums, of course you have you should have a knowledge on 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 the, be be active in the art scene, or you are knowledgeable about um, uh, art arts in that matter. So uh, uh, at UP Diliman, there, uh, there are courses uh, on museology, uh, also at the UST, uh, that's, um, yeah, in, in UST, there are, there are courses on heritage, so they can take on courses there if they want to get uh, a formal training on curation. No? But uh, for us at the Museo Cordillera, it's self-taught. Uh, we had a good team uh, uh, that we uh, learned from no, when we are starting up with the museum and then we took the points from there and improved better as we mount uh, our exhibitions no, uh, for the past year. So reading a lot also helps and then attending online trainings no, for free. Uh, there's a lot of museums who are also offering courses there. And also um, your interaction with uh, other curators, how they can uh, put up or set up their own exhibitions. Yeah. So more importantly, it's you're passionate about the subject and you're very interested on, on, on that particular topic. Okay. Um, there is an anonymous attendee who said there is an MA curator curatorial studies in the art studies department in UP Diliman. So thank yeah. you for that information. So anyone who is interested to enroll in MA curatorial studies, uh, please see uh, the art studies department in UP Diliman. Yeah, that's the art okay. studies in UP Diliman. Yes, okay. Um, okay, another question. Uh, another anonymous attendee. I wonder why our uh, participants are being anonymous this morning. Uh, okay. And the question is, I'm curious about the logistics of curating the exhibit, uh, the Feast of Merit exhibit, I think, uh, referring to that. May I know the timeline of how long was the research process versus exhibition design, etc., as well as the budget? Thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question because at the Museo Cordillera, Cordillera the preparation is usually, usually one year uh, before your expected date. So for the Feast of Merit, since we have already existing research, uh, we actually went back to the field again to talk to our uh, friends there if they can help us with uh, the logistics on the Ifugao Fale. No? So the preparations for that would take about three months. And of course, you have to secure funding, of course, to acquire this uh, house. So we have to um, um, secure external funding. No, it's not within the UP. So uh, th we were supported by the Museum Foundation of the Philippines. Uh, to actually acquire the object for us, no, because uh, sometimes artifacts such as this one are not, uh, you know, it's not in the list of uh, um, stuff that you need for the museum, no. So this is an, a major artifact, and we coordinated with the community. They were willing to give it to us, uh, and then they will replace the, the 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 old one with a new one. So that was accepted. Uh, so there's a mutual agreement between the Museo Cordillera and the community. We had to secure funding, so that takes a while, no more than six months. 
And then uh, we have to rebuild again the, the Ifugao Fale. So we have to call, uh, we have to arrange for the transport of um, uh, the artisans, you know, the house, the traditional house builders from Ifugao. And then of course, uh, the objects are, 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 we had an inventory of the, all the objects that would be exhibited. You know? So again, that's another six months. So uh, the preparation is usually one and a half years. No, for for the mounting of this exhibition. So the back uh, behind the scene, like paperwork and uh, uh, mounting, um, brainstorming. Uh, the brainstorming is very critical because uh, that's the core or the spirit of the exhibition. What you want to show and what you what messages do you want to uh, deliver? You no, know, to convey uh, to the audience. You no. Know? So all in all, for the preparation for the exhibition is uh, one and a half years. But usually it takes a, a while, like two years also for the conceptualization and then uh, logistics, funding, um, brainstorming. Um, uh, it takes a while. You know? so very, but the, the critical part is really uh, working with the team on how you can best uh, elucidate and express uh, the message. You know? Uh, found in the exhibition. So we have uh, three um, sub-exhibitions within the Feast of Merit uh, and uh, the scholars who are involved uh, with that is also engaged um, and they have to review also the exhibition uh, before the, the opening and, and, and if there are comments and other changes, then we have to attend to that as well. In some cases, uh, like we had an experience about uh, removing the tattoos of the Ibaloy Maniki, no? So some elders also came in and they wanted to remove the tattoos because they don't have tattoos in, in the past. They don't, they don't have um, knowledge that they had tattoos. So those points where uh, the community would come in and preview the exhibition, last minute changes, uh, the, cur the curators have to decide whether to attend to it promptly or to explain it, no. So all of this, no. Even in the exhibition itself, is a work in progress. No? Average, a lot may changes. Okay, thank you, Ikin. I think that also answers the question of Kelly Ramos. Uh, she asked, "How long was your curatorial process, uh, and how many experts were involved in the curatorial staff?" Yeah, so, so I think the, maybe uh, in that part, uh, in the experts, uh, you can uh, answer a bit more. For the content-based uh, information for the Feast of Merit, we had uh, three. Uh, so we had we had June Prilbret um, uh, contributing on the Bon Top because she did the research on that. We also have Dr. Laurie Weed who contributed uh, the linguistic uh, aspect no, of the Feast of Merit. Uh, for the Bontok part. And then we, uh, in Ifugao, um, I did the research for that in collaboration with Marlon Martin uh, from the Kiangan community in Ifugao. And then we had the Ibaloy, that's the work of Professor Ben Tapang. And of course, uh, there are a lot of researchers involved in this now. So we just lead the, the themes for the exhibition. But we have to dissect it clearly, what kinds of objects, what content should be included, uh, are the permissions no, in acquiring the objects ethical no, uh, in this. So uh, we had the curator, the director, uh, we had the graphic designer, we have museum researchers, and of course, uh, consultants who are working with us in, in, in the Feast of Mary. You know? so, so more importantly is the involvement of the community because without the community approving, uh, for instance, the Libkan, that's a very huge artifact that we have to carry from the field uh, to UP Baguio. So uh, getting the approval from the elders uh, contributed a lot you know, in, in, in the process. Yeah, so that's our team. Okay. Uh, I think it's still related to the logistics of mounting an exhibition. Uh, there's a question here, another anonymous attendee. And uh, the question is, uh, I wonder where you get funding for your major exhibitions as expenses for transporting artifacts, exhibition publications, and other collaterals. Not all HEIs have enough money for such expense. Yeah, the, the funding for the exhibition uh, for the Mosaic Cordillera, uh, 
uh, they allotted uh, a budget no, for, for exhibition. And then we also tap the support of the Museum Foundation of the Philippines. Uh, we tap also the uh, another group promoting advocacy for the arts or PAAFI. We also asked the help of the former Senator Lauren Legarda, who funded uh, two of our exhibitions, now the Feast of Merit and the Texel exhibition. So there is, uh, you have the director or the curator should be creative in looking for external funds because in the university, uh, there's a very limited fund uh, because usually it goes to the operate. Uh, uh, operations not of the museum, but not really for, uh, not a huge amount is uh, devoted for the exhibitions. No, so the director should uh, seek no, external funding um, to support no, the exhibition and the maintenance of the exhibition. You do not only solely uh, depend on university funds, unless uh, you have a very supportive uh, university president or university chancellor who are like-minded in supporting the project, then uh, then you have to tap those uh, potentials as well, sources no, for, for funding for your exhibition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question related to uh, MK. I think let's get all these questions now related. So how often does MK put up an exhibition in a year? And do you simultaneously plan for different exhibitions, especially if this will be mounted with just months in between shows? Uh, for the Mosaic Cordillera, the, the, um, the usual process is to change. Uh, we have a changing exhibition uh, every year. You know? That's the, the, the plan. But since uh, the, the exhibitions had become popular, it's well attended. So we have to ex extend the exhibition for, let's say, another half a year or even two years no, for, for that matter. Um, for instance, uh, we had the tattoo exhibition, which, which extended for more than a year. And then the Feast of Merit was almost two years. And then uh, we have the textile exhibition again until uh, next year. So ideally, you have to... Uh, change the exhibitions every year, no? but that's really very ambitious. No? It's very, very difficult. No? Uh, but if you have um, a very good team, uh, you have a good curatorial uh, uh, focus, then it should be uh, well done. Yeah. And then, of course, you have changing exhibitions within your exhibition, like special exhibitions on... Uh, 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 for instance, in the Feast of Merit, we had other smaller exhibitions. In the textile exhibition, we had uh, we will be having small exhibitions like face mask in the Cordillera. Uh, in the tattoos, we also had exhibitions on Makliing Dudag. So, uh, so an exhibition within an exhibition is also adding up to the cost. No, but uh, we have been very creative. We have been very innovative with the approach, so we can uh, mount exhibition depending on the demand of the public. Okay. Uh, another question from anonymous attendee. Bakit ayaw magpakilala ng mga ating uh, participants? Okay, so the question is, you mentioned the importance of interviewing or knowing the stories of the community around a specific artifact. Considering the pandemic, how can we compensate for the lack of field interviews in doing material culture studies uh, at the moment? Uh, so that's two questions. One is the importance of uh, the, the, the story of the artifact because that encourages the dialogue between the intangible to the tangible. No? So that connects uh, the story. No? When you hold the artifact, uh, of course, like I said, you can actually uh, allow the artifacts to speak by researching on the intangible. No? So you do this with interviews with the elders, with the artisans and all face-to-face pre-pandemic time. No? But now since we have this challenge no, and we are greatly affected by it, like uh, for me, I, I should be in the field doing my uh, research in the Cordillera, but uh, due to travel restrictions, that is no longer done. So uh, a lot of anthropologists right now, uh, there was a talk by Mary Rasselis yesterday about uh, field work in the time of COVID. No? And uh, I think what she stressed there is that uh, for uh, field-based researchers no? or 
um, scholars working uh, or relying on uh, on the field no, for information. What can be done is to have this remote collaboration uh, with the community. No, uh, I'm sure technology is a challenge. Uh, for this one, whether they have access to the internet and all that, but I think uh, uh, for my case, uh, we have we are I, I I am in a remote collaboration with my uh, interlocutors or the respondents in the field. No, so we regularly check on each other on the phone or uh, via email or sometimes we do Zoom uh, to collaborate. No, for for research and of course. Um, uh, while uh, this pandemic is still around, we can also do digital research. No, uh, for for instance, there's a lot of museums or even libraries and other repositories that have opened their archives for free. Uh, so, if you want to research on a particular object, you can actually visit uh, online no? uh, different museums that can provide information about that particular artifact. And of course. Uh, now there's a lot of virtual training on how you can do um, research via the via the internet. No, so there's such things as virtual ethnography where re researchers are are done uh, virtually uh, online. So I think that's the the new trend uh, right now. So we shift everything, all our programs, uh, our uh, research activities online because of this pandemic. So I think those are just my suggestions on the limitations that we have now because uh, of of the uh, of the pandemic. You cannot do face to face, but you can actually do online uh, research no, through remote collaboration. Okay, um, we have another question here. Uh, it says, how do curators decide the topic or even the omnibus of the story the exhibit wants to tell? Do you take into account the demands of the market? That is what people want to see or what people would be interested in. Um, yeah. So you, um, do you take into consideration the market demands? Yeah, that's a very big question, actually. So if you assemble your team and decide on the curatorial focus, uh, uh, the, the 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 challenge there is um, are there artifacts that you can display in the exhibition that can actually meet the resonance enchantment and wonder no so that's the most important thing in storytelling what objects would play that role when uh, you visit a museum no? how can your objects tell the story and in telling the story, like I emphasize in my my talk, is the the depth of research, you no, know, the depth of research, and the understanding of of that particular phenomenon or that particular object or a point in time where uh, you can actually uh, convey uh, these messages to the public. You no, know? well, uh, in terms of the market the, uh, demand that. Uh, largely uh, depends on the curatorial team no? if they want to be swayed by the market demand. But for the case of the Museo Cordillera, it has a specific focus on uh, uh, featuring the works of uh, the faculty uh, and the students of UP Baguio and then coming up with a theme no? based on the research material that are available. No, so I think we uh, that's the good of uh, the the good part in Museo Cordillera because it has existing research by the faculty, and one way of disseminating this is not only through publications but through creative means. No, uh, using the museum as a platform. No, more visible. No, uh, sometimes our audience or even um, others cannot access our journals. No. Uh, because they maybe they are too technical or uh, they have they don't have access to it so it's in the museum uh, which becomes a platform for all of these dialogues and conversation so i think um, that's important uh, the dialogue and of course like i said uh, to decide on a story you should have a good research you know, that's before bringing in your artifacts to the museum then the selection of good artifacts to tell the story to your audience. I think those are the uh, most important uh, aspects no, in curation. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, I think it's, there's a question which is somewhat related to this question of the demands of the market. And it has something to do with uh, globalization. So the question uh, from another anonymous attendee is, globalization is something we cannot stop from reaching our indigenous people and it has affected their practices and beliefs, especially the young ones. So how does uh, this phenomenon of globalization affect anthropologists' work? So I think it's to do with anthropologists' work, but I think it's uh, maybe to narrow it down to museums or curating uh, exhibitions uh, on the culture of indigenous people. I think that's the question being asked. Well, yeah. So I think there are two uh, strands in the question also, mm -hmm. the effect of globalization to museums and the effect on globaliz globalization to indigenous peoples. No? I think no? that's uh, the question. So uh, as you know, uh, with the pandemic, a lot of museums have closed down and uh, the trend right now is to go digital. No? Uh, so uh, for, for, I can speak for the Museo Cordillera, uh, we are already planning on a digital exhibition uh, of the, all the exhibitions that we had through a uh, virtual platform or the, uh, a museum website that can actually archive past exhibitions and current exhibitions. Even the collections will be uploaded there uh, and other activities. No? So uh, we are uh, exploring or we will we'll push through with the use of the digital technology. We will have an official website. So, so may synergy siya, no? So. Uh, we have a museum website. All the social media platform will also be used, no, in uh, in uh, uh, for the museum. No? So exhibitions, collections, and other activities, even publications, even an online store will be there. No, so we uh, in terms of the globalization, I think uh, the move to put Museo Cordillera online, no can actually engage other audiences to participate in the museum's activities, even if they are at home. No? Uh, so there. So uh, uh, very challenging also for museum workers because uh, uh, like I said, we closed down and then um, uh, for the case of Museo Cordillera, we have to remount exhibitions and uh, we are actually slowly uh, accepting visitors to come in, but uh, on a limited basis, no? just to uh, connect no? the, the, the museum to the community. Okay, and then the, the effect of globalization to indigenous peoples, that's a very, very tall uh, order question. No? Uh, so, so there's a lot of tractions in that, in that question. What, what is the effect of globalization? Uh, to indigenous peoples, no, uh, but I think uh, the use of uh, our IPs with technology, no, adapting to the the ways of the modern world, have already allowed themselves to participate in the conversation. No? So, for instance, in our research. Um, our friends from the communities are connected no. Uh, with the technology through their access to these informations from uh, the web. No? So they can now uh, research about themselves, about their cultures uh, through uh, accessing different repositories. No? So that, in fact, is very empowering, you know, the, the, the way they access all of this information from the internet. No? I think, uh, I, I hope I answered that question. Okay. Uh, and finally, we have a question with a name. <laughs> so we have uh, from Anthony Barandino of uh, WNSE Sambuanga City. And he says, in collecting uh, content or collections for museums, are we allowed to trade collection with other museums, especially for local tribal cultural artifacts? Is, if yes, how can we trade so that we can expand our exhibition? Okay, uh, based on my knowledge about uh, uh, with the trade, uh, you can what you, what museums can do is to loan artifacts uh, from different museums. No, so if you don't have, uh, if you want to exhibit 
uh, in your museum and you don't have that artifact and uh, the other artifacts are available in different museums, you can actually arrange for a loan of the artifacts. No, uh, I think that's been done, but I'm not really sure about trading artifacts. But if you trade or you loan artifacts, make sure that you have uh, copies or replicas of that that you can actually lend to other uh, museums. I think my suggestion here is better to loan uh, from the other artifacts, no? Espe especially when you are setting up your own exhibitions. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a related question uh, in relation to loaning uh, artifacts in museums. So it says uh, from anonymous uh, attendee, it is often the case that outstanding artifacts in indigenous communities are in museums abroad. In this case, what HEIs or communities have are copies or more contemporary pieces. What is the process of requesting artifacts from institutions abroad? Or okay. can we repatriate artifacts from abroad? Okay, I've done research uh, in different museums in the US and in Europe. No? Uh, the issue again is uh, uh, repatriation. No? There are, there are two kinds of repatriation. One is the physical repatriation where the host institution would repatriate that to the source, uh, source, source communities. But the issue there is uh, they do not exactly know where to repatriate that. No? And then there's, there's a lot of legal process on how you can do uh, physical repatriation, especially for human remains. No? And then the second one, I think this is uh, feasible. I have done that in my research on the Northern Luzon artifacts collected by the early German travelers or even during the American colonial period. What you can do is to do digital repatriation. Digital repatriation means that you can actually take uh, photographs of the object and then bring that back to the source communities and then elicit uh, information or new narratives based on these photographs. This is done in anthropology. It's called uh, photo photograph elicitation, or if you have the actual object, it's called object uh, elicitation. No? So you can do, what you can do now is to do digital uh, repatriation, not physical repatriation. Uh, also, uh, the museums also have well-documented these artifacts when they entered uh, the museums. No? And you can actually access the information about the objects, about the, the catalogs, the card catalogs, even the field notes of the collector. No? So we have done that for another project on the early German travelers in the Cordillera. So we were given access to, to take photographs of these objects and no? return that to your, to your communities. No? So, uh, in terms of physical repatriation, sometimes the curators would ask, uh, what, uh, is your museum well ventilated? Do you have aircon for 24 hours? Do you have security for 24 hours? And if you meet the, the standards no, for the museum, then we can repatriate. No? That's the case. But sometimes in the Philippines or even in small museums, we are not yet ready. Uh, so the best way really is to do um, uh, digital repatriation. Okay. Yes, the, the, the photographs that were exhibited at the Feast of Merit and in our uh, previous exhibitions were, digital, uh, were digitally repatriated you know, from the Newberry Library, from the American Museum of Natural History, from the Museum of Anthropology in the University of Michigan. So all of this uh, are... Uh, digitally repatriated to UP Baguio. Uh, and, and they are very appreciative of this because rather than uh, uh, it's kept in the archives or in the cabinets for the longest time, it's good that researchers are coming in to look at the collection and to see how we can actually bring out no, the narratives of these uh, photographs no, by bringing that to the field no, and exhibiting that to the, the museums. Uh, in fact, in the Feast of Merit exhibition, I'm, I wrote an article about uh, the descendants of the Kadangyan or the affluent uh, uh, 
people in traditional Ifugao society in the past. So when they saw their ancestors, uh, these are photographs of Dean Worcester's uh, uh, images of the Ifugao. No? So when these were exhibited, full-blown um, printing uh, of, the, of these archival photographs, when they saw this, it has a connection. Uh, it connected that to their ancestors, uh, it brought back memories no, of their practices. No? So it's very, very uh, useful to have this digital repatriated uh, practice, no? digital repatriation, and that can be done by various communities. At the Field Museum, there is now what we call as digital co-curation, uh, where these 10,000 objects are uh, online. You can check this out, and you can also uh, co-curate it by including information on what you know of these objects. No? Uh, so that's a digital resource that you can actually exploit in, in looking at artifacts no? uh, uh, that are, uh, are available overseas. No? So there's a lot of uh, museums who are doing this kind of practice already. OK. Thank you for that. Uh... Another question, it's from Sol Marvis Trinidad, and she says she's amazed with how the MK uh, is able to mount exhibitions that give audience a tactile experience. So she asks, how do you choose which items may be touched and those that cannot? And how do you communicate to excited audience that certain items cannot be handled? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I am a pro museum goer, so I like touching objects. I like our visitors to touch the objects, but there are also delicate objects that you cannot touch because they are fragile, like jars or uh, objects uh, that are sacred. No? Uh, so what we uh, inform, uh, what we do is we provide... Uh, digital uh, screens no so we have we use tablets for them to explore the objects no by touching uh, the the digital um, uh, the tablet no where the images of the objects are there no so that's another alternative and uh, in some cases we also have uh, videos prepared no about objects and practices where they can actually view uh, these objects. No? Uh, in some cases that you cannot avoid no, the, the excite, uh, ex excited museum goer, uh, sometimes uh, we had an experience in the museum where the visitors embraced our mannequins because uh, she was so proud to see the, the tattoos and all the native the, uh, the 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 native attire, you know. So we just saw it, and then of course it's too late to prevent her from embracing or hugging the the mannequin. You know? So we just allowed it because that is a wonder. That's the resonance. That's the enchantment in touching all of these objects. So uh, for me, um, if I don't catch you cut, uh, touching our objects, then it's fine. But there are cases where you are prohibited to touch because uh, these are original pieces and we don't want to be them to be damaged no, uh, by excessive touching. But in some cases, we also have replica objects, uh, miniature or uh, scale model objects that you can touch. No? Uh, and these are allowed uh, as part of the the educational activities of the museum, you're allowed to touch objects, replicas as well, no? And then. Okay. Uh, another question, it's uh, from Lily May Montano, and she says, uh, I think this has to do with the Feast of Merit uh, exhibition. How did you convince the local people to participate? And is there a monetary incentive for them? because this relates to the issue of cultural capital? Yes, that's a very uh, interesting question. So like I said, uh, we built as researchers on the Cordillera, as scholars in the Cordillera, we have a very long standing relationship with the communities that we work with. You know? So uh, even that spans for five to 20 years uh, relationship. You know? So we already built trust uh, with the communities that we work with. And uh, in a way, uh, the museum and the universities also helping them to preserve the, what is left of the, of the artifact, for instance. 
no and we come to uh, a memorandum of agreement no that this is only for educational purposes and it's not for profit uh and then uh, we also engage them uh, by curating the exhibition. It's not only the academics who are curating. We also allow them to curate what is right, what is necessary, and what is not needed, or is it uh, violating uh, their rights? No. So we come to that uh, agreement and we make sure that everything is ethical. In terms of compensation uh, with the acquisition of some artifacts, uh, yes, we purchase them at their value, so that could be a monetary value, and the cultural value is not, uh, you know, uh, that's a different thing that you have to discuss with the communities. Sometimes um, uh, we compensate them by uh, other means, no? uh, like, for instance, helping their schools, uh, providing medical um, supplies, no? or, or uh, instructional materials to their schools. No? So the, the, the compensation comes in different form uh, uh, for, for, for research, no? depending on the nature and the need no? of that particular uh, community. And we avoid, of course, uh, monetary compensation because in research, uh, that's not really, well, not really acceptable because you're like paying your your respondents. So we do this in different form, ethical and reasonable you know, for both parties. Okay. Um, another question is from Bonifacio Amber Jr. And he wants to ask, uh, how do you measure the impact of the exhibition? And uh, how is the return of investment? I think he's interested to know. <laughs> you know, after the funding and the effort, what do you get out of it, <laughs> perhaps? Okay, so uh, for the exhibition, it's non-profit. Uh, well, we only get our, our uh, returns no, of uh, of all these expenses through through our ticket sales. No, so there's an entrance fee in the museum, uh, very affordable. Uh, and reasonable, no? so that's where we get our, let's say, revolving funds and even the merchandise that we sell and the publications that we, we sell. But this goes to our revolving fund uh, that are also used for uh, the exhibition needs, uh, for, for the publication of our uh, exhibition collaterals. No? So we every month we have a statistics on uh, the number of visitors coming in. No, sometimes uh, the, the amount that we get from the ticket sales is actually an indicator of uh, whether uh, we have a very good exhibition. No? And also we have a feedback form. That's where we get uh, the comments and other suggestions of the, the visitors coming to the museum. No? So in terms of the impact, uh, uh, these are well publicized. The exhibition was well publicized. Uh, we had uh, we gathered very good reviews. Uh, we actually um, invited uh, 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 the Ifugao uh, community or the descendants of this particular um, Kadangyan. We also just the fact that they agreed no, to have these sacred objects no, exhibited in the Feast of Merit, that to us is also already a plus factor that we succeeded no, uh, in, in the collaboration that we had with the different communities. And of course, we have very good um, comments from our viewers. We also have negative comments, uh, but of course, that's a learning experience for all of us on how to redirect the, curate, uh, the curation and all that. So I think um, we have done so far very well in, in the past three exhibitions that we had at Museo Cordillera. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the response, to, there is uh, an anonymous attendee who, who wants to ask, uh, still in relation to the query on assessment or response to exhibitions, uh, how do you respond to those who might say that your exhibition is badly curated <laughs> or to some disgruntled um, maybe uh, viewers, they have some uh, things to say. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, so far, uh, I had a very violent reaction from uh, from students coming from Christian schools. I think that's the that's a challenge for me as a curator. When uh, he was reacting to the unclothed unclothed man- mannequins, no, and she's the 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 student was coming from a high school a christian high school and he refused to enter the museum uh when he saw the mannequins no without clothes no so for me that's uh that's very challenging for me how can i persuade him to come to to see the the rest of the exhibition because the mannequins is just uh part and parcel of the entire exhibition and to explore other aspects of the museum so uh well that was uh so we we with the curatorial team we discussed uh if we are cl- covering the mannequin with clothes or um shall we put some covers in other parts of the uh, other mannequins so because the, the 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 reaction was oh your mannequins are unshoed people the igorots are unshoed people uh, they don't have clothes and this uh, to me is unacceptable it's so unchristian that was the comment so for uh, to keep the integrity uh, of the exhibition is to keep the way it is to 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 feature the authenticity of an igorot culture now so we kept the exhibition as is we did not uh, well, we considered that we noted on the comment, but we did not um, modify anything in the exhibition. No, so I think um, we succeeded in in that one no? uh, to 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 keep the, the the curatorial integrity of the exhibition is uh, to follow uh, what we have talked about and what we want to show in the exhibition. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, another question uh, from John Ma- Emmanuel de Guzman. He, uh, he says, are museums obliged to get an insurance for, for their loaned or repatriated items? And if yes, uh, how? Yes, uh, I think we discussed this uh, in the session with Professor Boots Herrera about the insurance. No? So when you repatriate objects, uh, there's an insurance for the object and the carrier of the object. For instance, uh, uh, when you want to uh, borrow artifacts from a foreign museum, uh, you have to insure the object and the curator traveling to uh, phrases from Europe to the Philippines. You have to insure both the object and the person. And then uh, I'm uncertain how to get the insurance, but usually it's done there. And then of course, uh, for the exhibitions, you have to secure insurance where all the uh, precious, invaluable um, for the, all the artifacts that you put on display in your exhibition. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm still uh, on uh, exhibits and artifacts to be exhibited. Raymond Estrada wants to know uh, how do we mount exhibits considered by practitioners as sacred or my my visa? or carga, such as consecrated talismans and libretos, for instance. How do we manage um, instances like this? Uh, I, we don't have, uh, I don't have any experience on the anting anting or libretos, but uh, for the case of the, uh, in the Cordillera, uh, when you exhibit bulols and it, when it comes from the community, uh, there's a process of desacralization first before you can actually carry the objects. So sometimes uh, uh, you have to ask the elders to desacralize it you know, before you are allowed to uh, exhibit that in your museum. Uh, for other sacred objects, you have to uh, perform atmosphere. You now, uh, if if you can actually uh, mimic uh, an exhibition where they were found or how they look like then that's uh that's the the best possible thing to do you know? but as long as you get permission from the owners of these objects no uh 
uh, I think that's the prime importance first. You have to seek permission before you exhibit uh, such objects inside your museum. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Kelly Ramos and she says, may I ask for your suggestions or advice on how to bring out the resonance and wonder of objects in an already existing permanent exhibition? Yeah, so they have a permanent exhibition and it seems like they want to um, bring wonder and resonance to it. What, uh, first of all, what kinds of objects are there? So I want to know what are these objects before you can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, decide on how this should be presented. I think aside from the artifacts is the way uh, you mount the objects. You now, what kind of visuals or what kind of um, uh, platforms that you will use, how they are arranged, have a very, the, the lighting also have a very important uh, element there. No? So internally with the object, uh, first of all, I need to know what it is, Kelly, uh, what are they first before I can give the assessment. And externally, it has something to do with the lights, the proper lights, uh, the kind of platforms that you use, the exhibition display, the graphics and all that can actually contribute on the resonance of that particular object. If it's really, uh, you know, inherent, no? If the object has inherent qualities, then put it as natural as it is. But if not, then you can add extra, you know, as, uh, like, the, like I said, lighting, graphics and all that. Okay, and there's a related question from Jocelyn Guerra. Uh, she says, will it be ethical for a museum to purchase an artifact, say porcelain, in this case, a rare artifact representing a period from a collector to augment their exhibition narrative uh, to rep as a representative of a period? So they uh, have an existing uh, narrative, uh, exhibition and they want to augment that. Yes, that can be done as long as the, you have the funds and the collector uh, is willing to part with the collection to your museum. It should not be a problem. As long as you go to the, the paperwork, you know, the documentation, the legal process, and of course the funding that goes with it and the permission you know, to display that in your exhibition. It should not be a problem. Okay. Okay, another, I think, probably related question from an anonymous attendee uh, says, would you say it is a must to provide, even in a minimal extent, a story for every collection to add value to this collection? Yes, so uh, that one, we discussed that with the webinar with uh, Professor Boots, no? so the, the kind of uh, biography, the story, the narratives that you can elicit to the, uh, from the object is the significance. No? You add to the significance of that particular object. No? So um, usually uh, these uh, backstories are in your catalog. No? What they are, what they are made of, uh, what are the stories behind it. No? Uh, that can be done in, the, in your catalog. And it can also play prominently uh, in the captions of your objects in the exhibition later on. So that's very important. Okay, great. Okay, uh, next question. I think this, has, this is related to the earlier query on uh, market demand. And uh, how do you handle requests from, uh, from Arturo Pulga Jr. Pala? How do you handle requests from corporations that want to collaborate with museums in curating and mounting exhibits? Sometimes corporations use these collabs for their PR and CSRs to point the museum is just being used. Yeah. So uh, I will return the question to him. Uh, what kind of, uh, up to what extent can the museum compromise you know, the, uh, in terms of the mission of the museum, uh, the objectives of the museum? So uh, uh, for instance, uh, if corporate, cor uh, corporate yeah, companies, et cetera, wanted you to mount an exhibition that would be benefit for, uh, that would be uh, for their purpose, uh, 
uh, what is the percentage of uh, the museum's contribution there, no? So, uh, kung ako yan, sila na lang ang gumawa ng exhibition, not the museum. Uh, because if you have, uh, if the museum has a, has a mission, what are the objectives, then that's fine. Uh, but for other companies who would like museums to mount their own exhibition, uh, you have to set the, the guidelines for this, no? If you want the museum to be the setting, you have to set the guidelines uh, before you mount that exhibition. Ganun. What kind of collaboration can be made between your museum and uh, this potential uh, donor or sponsor or company? Okay. Uh, next question is from Jimbo Fatalia or Fatala. Uh, he says he's been lucky to experience the uh, exhibits in the Museum of Cordillera. And he's curious to know which among the five processes or stages you've mentioned in conceptualizing these exhibitions uh, has been the most challenging as part of your curatorial experience thus far. I think uh, the most challenging is the first step. No, in terms of uh, content development, no, uh, the lahat ng bakbakan in terms of uh, what you want to, what what story do you want to tell? No, that's, that's the basic thing. No, what what kind of story would you like to tell your audience with this exhibition? And sometimes in conceptualizing uh, an exhibition, um, uh because you work with a curatorial team and uh, my team is uh, really, no, so we, we go to a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, brainstorming and all that. And it's uh, sometimes it takes a while to uh, come up with uh, one consensus, uh, with a consensus, no? So uh, I think the beauty of curation, working with a team, no? So and dami daming ideas, how can you reconcile all of this? Uh, to come up with a final exhibition plan. No? So, ganon. And uh, I find the process and all the processes uh, fun. No? Uh, you go through, through each stages. Uh, I even did not encounter challenges, no? except for funding. Uh, but the whole process, the whole uh, curatorial practice is very exciting and it gives you that ecstatic feel no? that you move from one step to the other. In, in, in the process. Uh, and uh, I, I, for my case, I did not find any challenges because I have a very good team. Uh, I have very good support. You know? I have, uh, we have the materials, we have a very good research. You know? um, maybe the most challenging is the physical part, the mounting. Wala nang natutulog. We go home uh, we, at the VRs, no, just to mount the exhibition, uh, last minute touches, no. Physically, it's exhausting, but it's fun. So, that's the work of the curator, no. You have to argue a lot, think a lot, brainstorm a lot, look for money, uh, look for the right materials. Uh, you have to borrow. You have to uh, find the proper artifact. You have to. You are not sleeping, no. Uh, you stay up very uh i know you have to finish the whole thing before the show opens no? and i find this uh very learning for le a very good learning experience for for me working with the team okay uh next question uh i from anonymous attendee um has to do with uh I think the inter, the backgrounds of the people who are part of the team. So uh, Vesper Sheras asks, can a literature teacher be able to curate or at least help in the curation? Can his or her background on that field enough? Uh, I think as long as you have the disciplinal background, uh, for instance, my background is more in anthropology if your uh, field is literature, you can contribute in the creation in terms of the content uh, of the exhibition. No? You research, uh, uh, the data that you will put in. Um, and of course, uh, you, uh, in order for the curator to be successful in mounting your exhibition, 
uh, you need a designer, you need the graphics, you need the layout, you need uh, the, the 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 visuals, the the physical layout on how you will implement this. No? So that's very important. As long as you work with a very good team that knows what you want for the exhibition and that can render, kunyari, anong klaseng exhibition uh, plan, uh, what kind of uh, materials will you use, no? Uh, how will you display this, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you are able to work with a good team and execute your exhibition plan, then that should not be a problem. But uh, uh, critical kasi the knowledge, no? the deep knowledge that you put into uh curation in terms of the in terms of mounting the exhibition as long as you know the subject then it's fine no? as long as you know what it is and the challenge there is how to tell that story effectively okay uh, again still related to telling uh, stories effectively a question uh, there are, I think there are two related questions so the first one how do art museums go about with curating when they first have the artworks on hand? And the other, I think, related question is, uh, each HEIs have usually have existing collections. So do you do about, how do you do about conceptualizing the exhibition? Do you look at your existing collection and think of a narrative or a story, or do you think of the what narrative or story you're going to tell and look for the artifacts to tell this story? I think more or less that's the kind of question we ask here. Okay, I think uh, again I go back to research. Uh, what kind of research is available, and what are the the collections or the artifacts that are available? Uh, I think you have to look into this uh, two important components in the curation. No? So research and the, and, the avail and the artifacts. Then you build the story from there. Uh, because if it's reverse, you have the story, but you don't have the artifact. How can you mount an exhibition? No? So I think the research plus the collection. And if there's a way to, to have... A, uh, on loan agreements or loan agreements with other museums to complete the narrative or to complete the, the, the inventory of those artifacts uh, that you would like to exhibit, then you can do so. Um, it's hard to work on the reverse, no? So you have, uh, you have the story in mind, but you don't have materials. So that's a problem. You start with the materials, you start with the research first. If there are gaps, then you do the research. Because in research, uh, going out in the field, maybe you can find additional artifacts to complement your collection. And so I think that the, the, uh, the, the best way is to do the research first in order to identify what is lacking, if there's uh, the, the missing story, the, the, the lack of materials, then you can address that if you know your story, if you have the research on hand. Okay. Uh, more questions coming in. So this one, another anonymous attendee, uh, and he's, he or she says, for museums with limited funds, what do you think is an essential publication for a, any exhibition? And what would, so I think they're asking uh, really pr practical concerns here. What would be your basis for printing costs? and the number of expected audience and the duration of the exhibit. Okay, for the publication, uh, you can start with your brochures. Uh, you can start uh, with exhibition. Uh, you know, very old uh, brochure with all the information about the exhibition. And you can go for that. Then if you want to have a catalog of the exhibition, uh, that's, uh, that's a book plus all the artifacts that you exhibited. Uh, so that's a catalog. Or a monograph. Uh, you can do uh, a short essay and uh, include samples of the artifacts, important artifacts that were exhibited. So it actually largely depends on the, the, again, the curatorial focus and the purpose of the publication. No? So if you want just info, information, and then you can do brochures, you can do flyers. Then if you want uh, the museums to be a reference material, you, the, then you can do a uh, book catalog. No? So the Feast of Merit is a book catalog. Then if you just want uh, 
an uh, a monograph no that can be used as instructional materials uh, you can have the the small mo uh, the the monograph no, in a series no like um, like what we did with the tattoo exhibition the first inaug the inaugural exhibition we had a we had a monograph short essays and a sample of the artifacts exhibited but uh, just for information or reference no about that exhibition no so it, it largely depends on the funds that are available uh, the experts now working on this and uh, the purpose of, of that particular uh, publication. Okay, uh, more questions. This time it's from um, Nathaniel Joel Daroy. And uh, he says, in the case of a donated object from a quote unquote demanding donor, what is your advice on how to settle the differences between what ought to be done with by the museum director or curator and what the donor wants for his donated object for an exhibit. So the donor wants his object as the centerpiece of the exhibit, for example. <laughs> How do we strike a balance in this situation? Uh, yes, so, very interesting situation. Yeah, very interesting. So Nathaniel, <laughs> I want to know the object first, no? and what is the plan for, uh, for that uh, uh, for that object, no. Uh, if it's a demanding donor, you have to return to your curatorial focus or what is the narrative of your exhibition, no. Uh, ask why should that object be the centerpiece of the exhibition, no. So you have to return to the narrative of the exhibition, and uh, if you can identify what is the proper uh, wow factor what is the the object that can elicit that no is it the the uh, the object of the donor or is it something else maybe you can explain it to the donor no the the what what your exhibition plan is all about no so he could probably understand what it is no why is the object not the centerpiece uh ganun. Okay, we hope we, we don't get to that kind of sticky situation. Uh. <laughs> okay, um, another question from um, Randy Nobleza. Uh, and he says, may we know further the dynamics of the Cordillera Study Center and Museo Cordillera in curation and curatorial projects? Any advice for those who intend to put up a study center or school-based museum? Okay, so uh, Professor Ruth Tindan is the director for the Cordillera Studies Center. Maybe you can answer that for... <laughs> well, the dynamics of the Cordillera Studies Center. I think you better answer it. <laughs> we have uh, the, the CSC, is the research arm of the university, and it is here where uh, the faculty get grants for research. It is also there that they publish their research uh, in the form of monographs. It is also the CSC, which is the conduit for the dissemination of the research. Now, so for the Museo Cordillera, the materials no, from the CSC are used no, uh, as reference materials. No? Uh, it, is, it also forms a very good dialogue uh, because uh, the CSC also mounts forums, uh, seminars, uh, etc. No? So we at the Museo Cordillera also collaborate with them in terms of the content of the exhibition. So we have used extensively the publications of the Cordillera Study Center in terms of the content of the exhibition and tapping uh, uh, experts no, or scholars in the Cordillera as consultants. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Kelly Ramos and she says, regarding the use of technology to enhance an exhibition, is there available technology in the Philippines for audio tours? Uh, yes. Audio tour. uh, we have, yes, there is a technology for that. And that topic will be discussed next week by Everett Miranda on the use of digital media in exhibitions. Yes, Kelly. Okay. Um, and a curious question from Ves Vesper Sierra. He, uh, he or she says, when you exhibit traditional tattoos, do you have actual tattooing sessions during the exhibit? Okay, we, 
um, yes, we did. We did. No, we had uh, an, uh, a tattoo session uh, with a Taiwanese traditional uh, tattoo artist who came here to see the exhibition and as part of the educational programming of the Mosaic Cordillera, we invited the two artists also. No? So uh, his name is Kujui. He's a traditional uh, tattoo practitioner from Taiwan who came over to the Philippines uh, to do a tattoo session uh, with one of our museum volunteers as a guinea pig. Uh, I think he's, one, he's attending also. He's one of the participants. So we, we had a tattoo session. Uh, uh, just to highlight the tactile uh, aspect of the tattooing, aside from the videos that we presented as well. Yes, we did have. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another anonymous attendee um, wants your honest opinion <laughs> yeah. about uh, how long or how many trainings should a uh, wanting curator becomes a, a good curator. So I think uh, he or she is interested in, or maybe you can recommend uh, particular trainings or, or books that perhaps they can read uh, to become a good curator. That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> That's very organic. Um, when you say uh, the the in this or the indicator for being a good curator is that your work in the museum is well appreciated. And uh, when a person comes more than three times to visit your exhibition and recommend that to, that to anyone, that means you did a good job, no? So becoming a good curator is very uh, organic, no? So that largely depends, it grows over time, no? So uh, learning uh, doesn't stop, no? Even for me, I have to learn a lot of things, no? Uh, now we are moving to digital curation that's very new. But uh, there's a lot of reference materials that you could read. Um, you can refer back to the, the, the books that I mentioned in my talk. And uh, you can also do online training on curation uh, provided by the ICOM. Uh, there's, a, there's a website on conservators and curators. You can also check that. Uh, there are also handouts that you can access you know, on how to curate your exhibition. But I cannot answer your question because that's very organic. Um, uh, it, it comes, it comes, and you know you, you can curate when uh, when you are ready to do it. Okay, and I think uh, maybe this this would be our uh, last question uh, since. Uh, we're almost done with the Q&A portion. Uh, and uh, the question is, do you have plans for the next exhibition of MK? See? Yeah. And <laughs> what part of the process are you in at the moment? Uh, we Can have, we talk about this now already? Uh, we have a concept uh, of, the, uh, of the coming exhibition, but I don't want to dwell on it uh, in this webinar. But we have one. Um, two uh, themes already for the next exhibition. Uh, I think the textile exhibition is still, you know, it will be up until next year. So we are now preparing on the conceptual stage of the next exhibition, but I cannot divulge it here. Surprise. Okay. Um, maybe just one more question uh, before we end. Uh, one question came up. Uh, has to do with um, nudity of pre-colonial Cordillerans uh, and it's, it's a big issue for conservatives. I think uh, you partly talked about this earlier. Uh, is it appropriate to educate people about it or discuss the topic to other people by curating this in your museum by photo exhibit? Okay, uh, nudity is different. Uh, term uh, in terms of looking at the photographs of the Igorots during the American colonial period. No, um, remember that during that time uh, they see this as again. It depends on the how you view it. No, uh, but you have to in the exhibitions that we have. Uh, I think you have to understand this particular practice in, in their own context and in their own content. 
uh, why are they uh, why did they not have clothes because uh, the egrets are living in a very warm weather no so and there were no um, it was not a big deal for them during that time no it's only now that we are uh, we have a different view of this no so uh, like I said we kept the integrity of the exhibition following our research and the photographs that the archival photographs historical documents that we looked into uh, so we have explanatory notes as well available in the museum uh, about certain photographs with such image no? so um, uh, your question is some semester to discuss no, about uh, the colonial photographs with such content okay so I think uh, we also need to educate you know, our audience about that particular practice based on that particular uh, specific context in time. Okay, so I think uh, that's all for the the Q&A uh, portion for Doc uh, Ekin's talk. So uh, in the Q&A, there's a lot of interest uh, queries about the logistics and the practical uh, considerations in, in, in mounting an exhibit. And there's also a lot of uh, query in relation to the ethical concerns relate, related to mounting exhibitions. So there are questions on the response to the market, to the, uh, to the corporations, and even to demanding donors. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of query as well in relation to expertise that is necessary in mounting exhibitions. Uh, and also a lot of questions in relation to how do you conceptualize the narratives that are going to be uh, mounted in the exhibition. So we, th we thank uh, Dr. Amores for taking us through the process of the curatorial practice and how to conceptualize a museum exhibition. So, um, and, and thank you for generating a lot of interest for the Museo Cordillera's exhibitions. Uh, and they're asking, are we open for the holidays? <laughs> so I, maybe we can talk about the arrangements for a museo at this time uh, for the interested uh, participants. Yeah, so the Museo Cordillera is op open by appointment only. So you have to book in advance to visit the museum. We only allow 10 persons in the morning, 10 persons in the afternoon. Uh, and then we, there's no guided tour because uh, we avoid face-to-face -face, uh, visitors. But we provided videos on how uh, the range and also other instructions. No, uh, We have directional signs so you can actually tour the museum on your own. Uh, no guided tour. And uh, the the everything will be online later on uh, with our official museum website. So you can you can also access the information at the reception. We have a virtual tour of the museum. You can watch that while waiting, and we observe strict protocols inside the museum. Uh, we are not sure if we're opening on the holidays. I don't think so because we are uh, we follow the academic calendar. So we end on December. 16 or 20 no for the official opening because our staff also needs to rest and we have to you know replenish our energy uh with all these things going on right now and thank you everyone for attending uh this talk today uh for those who whose questions are not answered maybe we can you can just send us an email and we can uh, discuss in detail about your questions and i hope uh we can help you with the, cur the curation of your museum in level two. Uh, if, you're, if travel restrictions are lifted, then we can visit your museums, hopefully by next year, because no? that's part of the level two thing. Okay. Okay, so thank you, uh, Doc E. Can I remind the participants to kindly uh, fill in evaluation form through the link that is provided in the chat room? So we'll know uh, how we did in this particular webinar. And we have the next webinar next week. So we're this webinar for next week. So we're having uh, this resource speakers for next week. So we hope that you will again join us for this particular webinars uh, so that we continue our learning together in museum management. So 
thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, keep safe, everyone, and see you again next week for the next webinars. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Ruth.